I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This webinar is part of our educational online event series brought to you by Hawkridge Systems and our partners in digital manufacturing. Our topic today, a new era of design with multi-jet fusion, how additive manufacturing changes the way we approach design today. My name is Robin Gonzalez, and in addition to being your host, I manage the additive manufacturing sales for our strategic accounts here at Hawkridge Systems. Joining me today is an expert in 3D and HP 3D printers, Liz Storchstrom. Liz is an HP 3D printing application engineer with an expertise in designing for multi-jet fusion. For those of you new to Hawkridge, we've been providing engineering and manufacturing solutions to North American companies for over 20 years. As you can see, we have 21 offices and digital manufacturing labs across the country. In addition to products and services, we partner with the leading providers of engineering, manufacturing, and 3D printing solutions. So that is just a quick overview on Hawkridge. Now let's get to our topic today with Liz from HP. Thanks, Robin. Can you hear me all right? I'm going to share both my uh, webcam and my screen right now so that I can kind of show you some parts as I go and also uh, share you the presentation. All right, so as uh, Robin mentioned, my name is Liz Stortstrom. And I'm an application engineer with HP 3D Printing. So today we're going to get into um, some design strategies for using multi-jet fusion technology. So we're first going to start with a quick introduction into the technology, how it works, you know, and then we're going to quickly get into where it makes sense, right? And how can I actually start bringing this technology into my design cycle? Um, and we're going to spend most of the time exploring some specific case studies demonstrating you know, how MJF works and what are some good design strategies around it. So as we know, one of the main advantages that we get from using additive manufacturing is this higher level of design freedom. You know, there's fewer com constraints compared to other traditional manufacturing methods. And, you know, if you think of injection molding, you have to take into consideration draft angles and constant wall thicknesses and sometimes designing for like slides and lifters for more complexity. Um, so with additive, you know, we're not as constrained. However, you know, we still have to design for the specific process that we're working with. Um, the rules that we might use for, you know, injection molding or machining are not the same that we would use for 3D printing. Um, and on top of that, the guidelines that I'd follow for designing a part for MJF are not always going to be the same that I'd use for FDM, for example. So today we're going to focus on multi-jet fusion technology, you know, where it makes sense and how to design for it. So I'm going to start with a little um, example of what it looks like when this technology is running. So I'll show you a quick animation. And this is what it looks like in our JF4200 printer. And you'll notice a couple things. Um, one, there'll be a carriage moving left to right, and that's what's doing the actual printing and fusing. And then you're going to see a carriage moving front to back, and that's what's spreading the material. So here we go. So that was just a quick example, but I think it helps in just understanding how the technology works. But when you break that down, there's really four main steps to our fusing process. So first, uh, we use inkjet print heads to apply the liquid agents drop by drop across the bed. And here we're using uh, two main agents. So there's a fusing agent that we're using everywhere we want the part to actually fuse. And then we use a detailing agent around the perimeter of the part. And that's for creating this uh, boundary so there's no, we're not getting thermal conduction to the surrounding powder, right? The next step is that we're applying energy with our IR lamps. Um, and again, everywhere that we place that fusing, uh, fusing agent, that's where the powder is actually going to be raised above melt temperature and fused together, while the rest of the surrounding powder stays just below melt. And this whole time, we're monitoring the process with a thermal camera and adjusting the energy input into the system from layer to layer. Then once that layer is complete, we come across with a new layer of material and we just repeat that process until your whole job is complete. 
Um, and the great thing about this is we're actually able to achieve near isotropic strength throughout your build chamber and throughout your part uh, because the material is actually fusing across the layers, not just within a layer. So that's a pretty important uh, distinction with MJF. So let's take a little bit closer look. I'm gonna share one other little video and talk about uh, these different agents. So you'll notice a couple things. One, since we're using this powder bed technology, we don't need excess support material like in some other technologies, right? Because the powder acts as the support material. And two, how we apply that detailing agent and fusing agent is really important uh, to getting the crisp edges of those parts, right? Um, the only way we're able to kind of control the thermal experience of a part is by using those two in juxtaposition. So the fusing agent to gain more energy, absorb more energy from those IR lamps, and then the detailing agent to kind of cool off certain regions. So at this point, uh, I just want to clarify two common misconceptions about MJF. So this is different from binder jetting because we're not actually uh, depositing a binder down. You know, it's just these agents and all they're doing is controlling how much ener energy is being absorbed into the part. And similarly, it's not material jetting because the material is in the powder itself, right? And in both cases, we're able to achieve a higher, you know, higher mechanical properties, like I said, because we're actually fusing the polymer together. Um, it's also a little different from SLS, uh, because even though it's a powder bed technology as well, um, SLS delivers energy using basically a single point. It's that laser, right? And with MJF, we have these lamps that cover the entire width of the bed. Um, so this means a couple things for us. One, we can move very fast, right? Since the lamp covers the entire width of the bed, we can move quickly and print uh, layers in about eight seconds, regardless of the part complexity or the number of parts in that layer. Um, and the other thing uh, that's interesting about this is that since each voxel of material is exposed to energy for a longer period of time with MJF, um, the material doesn't have to be as reactive. And so lower reactivity means lower degradation of the material over time. Um, and that's what allows us to use up to 80% recycled material job after job. So with all of that in mind, we start to get an idea of where technology like MJF makes sense, right? And not just you know where we can use it, but where it's really adding value. Um, for example, in the transportation and industrial industries, there's value in that isotropic strength of the parts, as well as uh, you know, the ability to reduce, reduce weight um, and also fluid tightness of the material. And we'll get into those uh, in a little bit. Uh, in the medical and consumer spaces, you can really start to take advantage of this idea of mass customization, you know, where you can design a robust final product uh, that could be completely customized for each end user. Um, you know, imagine creating cu custom prosthetics or orthotics, or even you can see here, you know, a custom cast specifically for a person's arm, right? So some pretty cool things start to open up with additive. So, you know, where does this make sense? We actually have a lot of opportunities to start introducing additive. Um, if we think about our product life cycle, you know, a lot of us are familiar with using additive for prototyping, right? Low volume, quick iterations, um, it makes a lot of sense. But these days, additive is moving beyond prototyping. So, and with MJF's, you know, strength and throughput advantages, you know, it means you can use it for full production for low to mid volume applications. And here you can even see the pictures in the middle are actually examples of HP's own um, products where we have MJF parts in the final production. And then even for higher volume products, you can still take advantage of additive uh, with this idea of bridge production. So allowing more time for design iteration by using additive before committing to like a tool design. 
And then after your product is already in the market, um, there's a number of opportunities to save on cost and physical space by moving to a digital inventory and printing your spare parts, right? Instead of having a physical inventory. And throughout this whole product life cycle, uh, there's still advantages in using uh, additive in your manufacturing space. So manufacturing aids, uh, such as jigs and fixtures. And we'll take a look at a couple examples of those. So we're gonna dig into some specific design strategies, um, but your exact approach to designing for additive or introducing it um, is ultimately gonna depend on when you introduce the technology into your development cycle. So if you think about the product design cycle, um, obviously you can introduce additive at any point. Uh, earlier on, there may be more opportunities since the exact geometry of the parts will be less defined, right? Um, but even when your design is set, there's still going to be ways to take advantage of 3D printing. One of the easiest options in this case where your product has already been designed, let's say your the external geometry of your part is set, right? It has to fall within specific space constraints or made up with certain parts. Um, you still have this opportunity to do uh, light weighting. And how would we do that? So first option, hollowing, pretty straightforward. Um, this is a great option for parts that were originally CNC machined. And therefore they probably have excess material that's really not needed for its end function. Um, in some cases though, you may need a little bit extra mechanical structure and integrity. And so that's a perfect opportunity for using lattice structures. Um, and I have some examples here. You can really get you know, crazy with lattice structures. There's a very simple example on the slide. Um, you can see here, I actually have a TPU part here, so it's got a little bit of flex. Um, but you can make some really intricate cell structures um, and really start to manipulate the response of your part by using different lattice structures. Um, and there's a number of different softwares that can do this. I know, you know Materialize has some offerings and I believe uh, Hawkridge is going to have a webinar on that coming up shortly, so keep an eye on that. Uh, but in both these cases, you know, there are easy first steps into, you know, stepping into this world of designing for additive because a lot of different software programs already have tools to perform these functions automatically. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that you can either leave, uh, you know, some openings for the material to escape the parts or just leave it closed so there's some material trapped in the part. And in those cases, you're still saving on material and agent usage because that unfused powder is actually less dense than the fused part. So it's just a good tip to keep in mind. The, so the opportunity for additive uh, increases though, the earlier on you are in your product's development cycle. And that's just because you know, the parts can be directly designed for additive um, instead of working around previous design constraints. So in the next few examples, we're gonna dig into these three areas, this idea of design for process optimization, design for assembly, and designing for performance. So to talk about designing for process optimization, we have to consider the specific process. So in the case of MJF, you know, it's a thermal process, um, and the thermal experience that every voxel has as it's being fused and as it's being cooled, that's going to affect uh, the final part. So here you can see an image from our printer's thermal camera. And using this camera, we can control the heat delivered to the bed from layer to layer. Uh, but at the same time, you know, to achieve the most consistent results and the highest repeatability, we still wanna pay attention to how we're designing and positioning the parts in our build. So uh, things like keeping cross-sectional areas relatively consistent through the height of the build is gonna lead to more consistent part quality results. And now that we have this idea of consistent fuse area in mind, we start to trend towards these more skeletal designs. So take this part, for example. You know, it was originally designed on the left for injection molding, uh, and it requires this continuous section for material flow we obviously no longer have that limitation. And in fact, with MJF, uh, printing less material is going to save you on part cost 
um, and also help maintain this consistent thermal experience across the entire part. And this is a really simple example of, uh, you know, a, a skeletal structure, but this approach holds for very large, complex 3D shapes as well. And the nice thing about MJF is that, you know, that complexity is coming for free, right? If you print a complex 3D structure, skeletal structure using, you know, FDM or material jetting, you're going to have to think about support structures and the direction you're printing it and all of that. You know, and that support structure, that's material, you know, you're paying for and it's ultimately thrown away. So, uh, you know, in this case, again, with the powder bed approach, you don't need that. And, you know, it actually becomes a much more efficient process for these very complicated parts. The team who designed our 500 series printer actually took full advantage of this approach. So on the right, you can see an image of uh, just some of the MJF parts that we used in our own printer design. And you can see some of them highlighted, uh, highlighting that kind of skeletal structural approach. There's also some in the background that um, you know, were used for ducting um, and you know, all sorts of different parts. But in total, we used 229 MJF parts in our 580 printer. So this is this is huge. Um, and that was 141 unique MJF designs. So, you know, besides from like the speed to part and the design flexibility and all of this, this resulted in huge cost savings. So between uh, either designing final parts for MJF, um, using MJF for bridge production, like we talked about, or using MJF for parts that you know, eventually we're just obsoleted because designs change and that happens. Between all of those uh, strategies, the team was able to avoid or defer nearly $5 million, $5 million in cost due to tooling. So this, you know, this is massive. When you start considering all the savings from switching, you know, multiple parts over to additive, this really starts to add up. So another place that HP found opportunities for switching to MJF was in our large format latex printing business. Um, in this case, the printer was already in production, but um, they were looking for cost and weight reductions for some of their machined components. Um, so let's look at one in particular. What you can see here is a design progression for one of these machine parts. So on the left, we have this machined aluminum block. And then all the way over to the right, we see this topology optimized structure that ultimately resulted in a 93% weight reduction and a 50% cost reduction. And what's fascinating about this design is it's obviously something that's only achievable through additive, right? Because it allows for the most efficient approach to design in terms of uh, performance of the part and material usage. But what you'll also notice is that you don't always need to jump to the most optimized solution. Even by taking that first step, you see there's a substantial weight reduction. You go from 355 grams to 80 grams just by moving to this plastic 3D printing block design that they have in the second picture. And then by moving to the next step, by adding some latticing and some holes, you get brought that down to 55 grams. So you can tell that this there's a sort of progression here. And ultimately, how far you go is going to depend on a lot of different factors, um, including the parts function and also just your time and resources, right? So aside from designing for the process, we can also design for assembly. Without all the same limitations as traditional manufacturing techniques, we can now consolidate parts like this um, that used to have to be you know, assembled with fasteners all into one part. This, uh, this is a drill extraction shoe, and it's actually a device used in manufacturing HP's printhead nozzles. Um, basically removes silicon sludge and water from the machining process, and it, it just makes the whole process more efficient. Um, and by consolidating this design from the seven parts, you know, plus some fasteners uh, into that one MJF part, they were able to uh, enable 95% cost reduction and a 90% weight reduction versus that original design, uh, which is mostly made up of machined aluminum parts. So again, 95% cost reduction, this stuff 
really adds up. This is a huge cost savings. Uh, and this part is actually still in use today on our manufacturing lines. Okay, here we have a duct that's pretty interesting. You know, so this is a duct in our 500 series printer. Originally, it was designed for injection molding, and uh, there were a number of limitations with that. So you, you may notice there's some blades at the bottom that were pretty thin. Um, this created issues with material flow. Uh, the sidewalls would need to, uh, to have draft in them, you know, and there's also just lots of assembly steps with these six different parts and fasteners. So in this case, if we look at the middle picture, the design for additive was actually simpler compared to designing around the injection molding constraints. You know, we see uh, we see a lot of MJF parts being used for ducting because unlike some technologies, MJF uh, can produce airtight parts. But I think you all are interested in the right picture the most probably. <laughs> so to take this design a step further, um, we actually worked with Siemens and they ran a CFD analysis to demonstrate, you know, how could you optimize this duct shape to even further improve flow rate. And I really like this example because, you know, if you or I were designing designing this part and we're trying to dream up, you know, the best uh, duct design, this probably wouldn't come to mind, right? But using the a combination of like the right tools and technology, you can see that we start to come up with some really unique solutions um, for both this idea of designing for assembly and for performance. So now we're going to take a look at another another example that takes advantages of uh, takes advantage of both of these strategies. So I'm going to share another quick video with you all. was a little more exciting <laughs> than the last ones. <laughs> so here we have um, an end of arm tooling example from uh, IAM, which is the International Advanced Manufacturing 3D Hub. So this particular grip has four pneumatic suction cups and this customized frame shape designed to you know, exactly fit the part that it's moving around. And then these four suction cups are directly connected to uh, these four independent fluid vessels. And all of these features, you know, are designed into this one single part again, when, you know, normally these would have had to be separate and a much more complicated structure. Um, but by using MJF, they were able to replace that complex design of the previous gripper model with this kind of newer, organic, more efficient structure. And that resulted in over an 85% weight reduction and reduced their lead time to part um, by 30%. So again, massive improvements by switching over. Um, in this case, they were also able to include a new coupling mechanism, which facilitated a faster connection with the robot. And then that, you know, just further reduced the process and install time. So on top of just integrating the features they already had, now you can start to think, how can I add more unique features um, that's just going to really optimize the function of this part? So this is a really great example of taking full advantage of, you know, additive. And you know, I, I know we talk a lot about weight reduction and some applications, it may not matter as much, but you can imagine in the world of end of arm tooling, it really makes a difference, right? You're specking a robot arm for a particular load and you really don't want the end of arm tool or the gripper to be taking up a really large percentage of that load. So similarly, here we have a pneumatic gripper. Um, so when it, you can see when the spiral is filled with pressurized air, the grip closes, and then when that air is released, the grip opens up again. That allows for just this relatively fast opening and closing uh, of the grip by regulating the frequency of the air. 
And with additive, you know, it's really easy to test and find weak points and then only edit your design uh, to improve the function exactly where it's needed. You can kind of see in the picture um, the difference in left to right. You know, in this case, they added some small features to improve strength and achieve more precise movements. Um, and they only had to add that where it was needed, right? They weren't constrained by any other manufacturing limitations. And then one other requirement for this grouper was that it needed to last a minimum of one million cycles. And so the MJF part was able to pass that. So that was really cool to see. Um, and on top of all that, again, you know, this resulted in 87% lighter part um, and their install time dropped by 40%. So really big savings. One topic that we haven't talked about yet is how to actually pack your build. So we've looked at maintaining consistent fuse areas across layers. Um, you know, we also know MJF has isotropic strength, so you don't really need to worry about that too much with part orientation. Uh, but there's some other considerations we should talk about as well. To get the most out of your printer's build volume, we really want to pack the parts efficiently. For, uh, for MJF, increasing the build density means that you're gonna get higher throughput and you're also gonna lower your part cost. So an easy example of you know, designing for packing efficiency is uh, this example on the left, right? If you have parts that stack well together and you include you know, good clearance, at least five millimeters, you'll have pretty consistent fuse areas across the layers, and you'll be able to fit a large number of parts in a single build. Um, you may, may even have cases like the pictures on the right where you know, the parts happen to fit together nicely side by side like puzzle pieces, uh, or you can mirror the parts, and that's great, but in reality, we actually have a lot of parts with straight walls and right angles, right? Because that's easy to design and that's what we're used to. Um, but in a lot of these cases, you can tilt those surfaces without affecting the functionality. So in the example on the left, uh, they actually saved 40% on cost, uh, part cost savings by just angling those walls 15 degrees. So this is, you know, these are some pretty simple strategies. Let's look at a little bit more complex example. Yes, so this is a very real and very recent example of designing for packing efficiency. Um, you may have seen in the news that there's a lot of 3D printing applications popping up uh, in response you know, to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and HP and Hawkridge have been a part of that, you know, just working with um, trying to support a number of these efforts, anything from stopgap surgical masks to nasal swabs for testing, in this example, we're looking at a face shield design from Avid Product Development. So the frame itself is printed using MJF, and then they use a thin plastic sheet uh, to wrap around the frame to form the actual shield. Originally, we were printing these uh, frames curved since that's the final form, but you know this quickly proved inefficient for packing. Uh, especially in this time when everyone's trying to crank out these parts as quickly as possible. So we moved to this unfolded design um, that actually packs much more efficiently. Uh, and then again, after printing, all you have to do is assemble the part with these built-in fastening pins and holes. So pretty simple uh, assembly process. So when we look at the final build, uh, we're able to print 290 of these frames in a single build on the, our 4200 or 5200 series, our a larger uh, production printers. So that means, you know, with one print, a, you know, a day, you can print nearly 300 of these shields, face shields a day. You know, that's huge. Uh, and what's great about this design also is that it allowed for improved packing efficiency on our smaller product, uh, the 500 series. So even though the build length is shorter um, than the part length, you know, its design is such that you can still bend the part and fit it in that build volume and still pack more efficiently than in your original design. And, you know, sometimes packing is collaborative. You know, we don't always have to print parts one at a time. 
Uh, it's common actually to have a group of parts designed for MJF, you know, within a given product. So in that case, it may make sense to print these parts as sets um, to help improve packing efficiency and also to build your product faster. Imagine having, you know, 20 different parts, all of varying size and geometries. Uh, some of these might pack well together, you know, printing them on their own, and some of them might not. So you're probably going to get to a more efficient packing structure if you mix and match in a set. Um, and then also think about your assembly process. Instead of waiting for 20 separate builds to print to start your assembly, you can start it right away after one build because you already have several sets of parts ready to go. Hey Liz? Yeah. I have a question that came in um, asking, typically how long does it take to print out a part? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So it really depends, it depends on a few things. So one is which printer you're using, right? Um, but also how big that print job is. So, and then this is why we talk, talk about packing efficiency, because if I'm going to print uh, a full job on our larger printers, um, it may take somewhere between, you know, nine and 16 hours, depending on your settings, right? Um, and we can talk more about that. But uh, if you, you could print just one part in that build volume, and then you would get one part and it would take that, you know, 16 hours, um, but it would be in your best interest to fill that build volume uh, with lots of parts, and then you're getting more, you know, throughput. But of course, you don't always have to print full builds. Um, you know, you could print pretty short builds and just get faster time to part. But in those cases, keep in mind, um, it is still most efficient from a time and cost perspective to try to fill your build volumes as much as possible. So just something to keep in mind, yeah. So now I'd, I'd like to switch gears a little bit, okay? So we talked about our 4200 and 5200 series printers, um, and those print in this kind of monochrome gray color. So if you can see my webcam, it's kind of this, this gray color. But our 580 printer can actually print in both white and full color. And that's what this looks like. We've got our white monochrome parts, but then also full color. So hopefully you can kind of see that. When we, you know, when we talk about DFAM, uh, we often leave out color because historically there haven't been a lot of additive technologies that can produce full color parts. And most of these technologies result in pretty brittle parts. Um, but again, with MJF, that core fusing process is still the same. So we're still maintaining uh, good mechanical properties, even though we're printing this color agents around the outer surface of the part. So that means we can create these full color parts and they're robust enough for use in your final products. Uh, a great example of where this could be useful is in manufacturing aids. Uh, these parts, you know, they get a lot of use. They need to have good mechanical strength. They need to withstand interaction with other parts. And obviously this part could have been printed in one color, but let's look at what we can do when we add color. You've got red and green calling out some critical surfaces and features. Um, you might not be able to see it well, but there's a QR code in the middle of the part that's printed directly on it. And you can imagine that could reference anything you wanted, you know, anything from a part number to uh, instructions for use for that specific tool. And then of course, just all of the text instructions and safety labels become more legible, right? They're easy to see. And I like this quote um, from Yazaki. It says, when you add the benefit of color, you're adding a new mode of visual communication. And I like that. I like thinking about it that way. You know, this isn't just um, adding color for, you know, the novelty of it, but we can do that as well. But it's really leading to improved efficiency and reduction of mistakes on the manufacturing line. You know, at the end of the day, that's saving you time and money. And outside of the manufacturing space, there's obviously a lot of opportunity in using color for uh, unique customized designs for consumer goods. So again, with MJF's resolution and mechanical strength, you can achieve these really intricate, unique designs that you know, can be used as your final product. Um, and this opens up 
you know, a world of mass customization options. Uh, you can see these examples of different cases from fresh fiber, you know, uh, this mouse cover, glasses. So really anything you can think of. I've got this colorful bracelet here. <laughs> I wish it was a little smaller. It doesn't quite fit, but, <laughs> but yeah, lots of things you can imagine. And again, look at this lamp design. Um, imagine doing that with FTM, you know, or uh, material jetting, right? You would need a lot of support material in the middle, but here that's something we don't have to worry about. But what is the process for adding color to a part? Uh, I'm not going to go into great depth into this as, you know, there's a huge range in software options and capabilities when it comes to adding color, but I think it's good to summarize the three main categories so you have an idea of what the approach is. So on the left, uh, the simplest option is to add color to the entire part. This can be useful if you want to color code parts, um, say you want to track uh, design revisions as you're going through design cycles. Um, there's even cases in the aerospace industry where service parts uh, need to be brightly colored. And then that way they're easy to see, easy to identify, and can be removed before that aircraft goes back into operation. And then in this fixture example in the middle, it's also pretty simple to add color to faces. Uh, a lot of designers use this trick uh, to simplify the color application process. You know, if you can engrave text or, um, you know, create separate faces, then you'll have unique surfaces that are easy to click and change the color of. And you can do that in a lot of different programs, um, including CAD programs. But, you know, to really take full advantage of color, we start talking about uh, texture mapping. So this is this example on the right. Um, it's also a concept used in gaming uh, where you take a 3D object and you'd wrap an image around it um, in a specific matter, uh, manner and you'd be mapping that out in a certain way so that it looks like the part you're trying to achieve. And then that way you can work with this 2D color image and uh, this 3D mesh object separately. So as you can see in the right picture, you can achieve some you know, pretty impressive designs using this technique. Um, and you can really you know, do a lot of different things, but it's obviously the most intensive and takes the most skill, right? So a few different options here. But ultimately, you know, whichever technique you use, color can open up this whole new dimension of application opportunities, right? We can improve efficiency and clarity with this idea of informational color. You know, we can add value with customization. Uh, you know, we can even level up our prototyping game. <laughs> and uh, I like the example on the right. We even have a number of hospitals using our 580 printer to create visual aids um, for surgery prep. You know, so this is ultimately helping surgeons be successful in the work they do, which is really cool to see. And, you know, these are just some areas we found that, uh, you know, where color, functional color can be beneficial. But as I mentioned, this is a brand new capability, right? Um, it's really opening up new ideas. So I'm sure we're going to continue seeing a lot more compelling applications pop up for functional color um, over time. Okay, so we've reviewed a number of examples today, but the main message is that the rules for design are changing, right? Now that we can move more and more applications over to additive manufacturing, uh, you know, technologies like MJF, our mindset of how to design for these also has to shift. So instead of thinking about, you know, minimizing machine operations, we start looking at minimizing material usage. Um, and instead of worrying about fastening strategies, we start to consolidate parts, uh, assemblies into single parts. And, you know, finally, instead of worrying about separate operations, finishing operations, painting operations, we can now print it directly onto a fully functional color part. So really by taking into consideration the technology that you're designing around, you can really start to open up a huge amount of design freedom um, and, you know, bring new value to your particular business. Okay, so here's a list of resources that you might also find useful um, if you want to dig deeper. So we have an MGF handbook that you can download for more in-depth design guidelines. 
Um, we also have, you know, these are just a few case studies, but we have lots more online, um, so you can go check those out at the, that link. And finally, at the bottom, we keep this webpage um, up to date with all of our latest COVID-19 containment efforts. Um, it also includes uh, printable files that you can download. So if you want to print your own, you know, masks or shields, um, you can find all of that stuff there. Okay, but of course, feel free to reach out, you know, either to myself or your contacts with Hawkridge. Um, you know, we keep a really close partnership, you know, as soon as we have new information, they have new information. So we really just want to make sure we're supporting you um, and helping you be successful. So uh, with that, I will pass it back off to Robin and thank you guys for listening. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Really appreciate that. Great information. All right. Well, in closing, uh, the slide you see here gives you an idea of the depth of our solution offerings here at Hawkridge from design to data management to simulation and stress testing, all the way through prototyping and production. We have the software, the services, and the expertise uh, to help you achieve your goals. And our team loves the challenges. So let us know what's on your mind and we'll do our very best to help you solve it. Thank you once again, everyone. We're gonna be closing the webinar today, but if you have any questions, please reach out to me. If you need any content or you have any requests, I'm more than happy to assist you. Everyone, thank you so much. Liz, once again, fantastic job and have a great day.